So, Chile is going to explain to the class NPAs and OPAs, the pros and cons to both, the indications and contraindications, and then she is going to demonstrate to you how this works. Okay. Speak loudly for everyone to hear. Okay. So, these are called the verbs. It's supposed to be just, we don't know anything. Okay, these are OPAs. And these are NPAs. Which stands for? OPAs are stand for oral pharyngeal pulmonary curve. And these are stand for nasal pharyngeal airway. Okay. They are used to secure someone's airway person cannot do it on their own. Um, an example would be the person is unconscious. Um, you would use a OPA, which goes inside the mouth, oral, and you would use it um, to hold back the tongue away from the back of the throat, which can cause an occlusion, causing them not to be able to breathe, even if you were to give oxygen. So, um, NPAs go inside the nose, they do the same thing. You would use these um, if a person has an intact gag reflex, meaning that the back of the throat maybe tingles or something and they flinch, which could cause them to throw up. So you would want to use a NPA in that situation. Um, you wouldn't want to use, I mean NPA, you wouldn't want to use an NPA in a situation where a person has trauma to the head, neck, or just the head and neck, maybe the spine, but uh, because it can cause further damage um, to the brain, possibly. So, um, like I said, a contraindication to the would be to take gag reflex. And there are three ways to insert uh, OPA. I hope I'm using Words. Am I using the right words? Okay. There are three ways to insert an OPA. You can insert it by holding the tongue and flipping it at a 80 degree, 180 degree angle, like this. And you want to remove it by following the curvature of the mouth of your patient. You can insert it at a 90 degree angle. Try not to forget to and you can also do this with a tongue depressor, which is something that you would always want to do on children because they have small airways. And you would just slide it down the tongue depressor. Make sure you hold your tongue pretty good. This ain't working, but you don't think Okay, those are three ways you can insert this. And also, uh, oh, you want to measure also. I didn't show y'all that, but you definitely want to measure when you're using an OPA or NPA. And to use an OPA, you would measure from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe to make sure that you have the right size, just so you know. And there are indications on them for your paperwork that tells you what size they are. And the same thing for your NPA, you would measure from the tip of the nose to the tip of the earlobe. And you will also measure these by the width. They're different width by the size of the near nostril. So once you have the proper size, you want to piggy the nose just a little bit because you don't want to break their nose. And you would start on the side that has the larger airway. Um, I've heard that most of the time it's on the right. So when you're inserting on the right side, you would put the bevel against the septum of the nose and insert in a straight back motion towards the back of the head. If you come across any resistance, what you want to do is pull it out and 
and rotate it so that the bevel is now against this septum, peeking back the nose, and insert it. Once you're halfway, you want to rotate it so that the person is actually getting oxygen. Okay. So just pretty much. Any questions or concerns? Pick your next victim. Um, right here. Right here. Bradley. Come on. Yo. For real? Bradley. Like that. Bradley is going to demonstrate and talk about the suction unit. Oh. And, uh, mm -hmm. The Crisco work? Mm. Water bank. Mm. Crisco dog. <laughs> Bradley's going to explain suction, the rules for suction, the indications, contraindications, and whatever else he wants to talk about. Nope, don't open that. Don't open that. So the suction device, you would, uh, the suction device would be used on a patient with any sort of, any liquids or anything in their airway, which could, uh, possibly cause any obstruction to the breathing or anything like that. So you use it on patients with vomitus or so on or any frothy substance out of the mouth or throat area. And when using it, what you would do is uh, you would put it down or you would uh, deter you would check the device to make sure it was working before you place it in. You'd uh, check the suction, which uh, you would have to, on the tube there's a thing you hold. Good one. On the tube, there's a, a small hole. You would block that and then check to determine whether there was actually suction or not to make sure the device was working properly. And then after that, you would uh, insert the device into the patient's okay, mouth. Hold on. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. Sure. Like, turn it oh, on. Yeah. Demonstrate what you're doing. And then uh, after you determine whether the suction's properly working or not, you would uh, insert the device into the patient's as far back as you could reasonably as uh, permit, which would be. Mm. Until you see, you know, not further than what you could actually see. And you would, uh, when you're inserting it, you'd make sure you weren't using the suction you had. And then as far as you could get it down to where you could see through it. And then uh, you would not use the suction until you were coming out. And you'd only do it after you're coming out. When you're coming out is when you would uh, use the suction. And you would do it for no longer than 15 seconds. And when you're coming out, you would do whatever method you prefer, which would be the zigzag or the other, when you're coming out. And then, uh, after the, suction when you remove the uh, suction you would uh wait an amount of time before you do it again to make sure that the oxygen in the patient was able to you know, go back to normal because you try to uh you want to avoid reducing the uh, oxygen in the uh the uh the, uh, you do it so you wouldn't cause any damage or issues with the lungs or the uh air that is constantly in your throat the air that is uh, additional air that is stored there Dead space air. Dead space air. <laughs> uh, so you wouldn't remove the dead space air or anything like that, which could cause an additional, a lot of additional issues. as you can or well as far as to the 
then you would double check the airway to see if you uh, were able to clear the blockage or if it would need to be performed again, but you wouldn't perform it immediately after you wait till the patient was able to, uh, or you'd provide oxygen to the patient before doing it again in case of any uh, issues that could be caused otherwise. Any questions? Go ahead. Can we give um, after one cycle of suction, can we give two rest of them? What's the role? The oxygenation before each section is done. Can you give the beat? Um, yeah. Was it two to three? Um, not a group breather? No. no. Can we give a 15 minutes per minute? Okay. One breath every five to six seconds? Or That's just a wrap, Nick. Mm -hmm. That's two rest Say that one more time. That's two rest of breath. That's what I thought. She's saying for two minutes, once oh, every five to six seconds. That's yeah. rescue breathing on an apneic patient. So we have to provide oxygenation before the next cycle of suction. So here's my question. So what happens if he's got copious amounts of fluid in his mouth? Lateral return. Return to his side. Turn it on his side and then what? And then you can suction on the side if you want to, or give oxygen if you give suction while he's laying on the side. We got to get it out before we give oxygen. Yeah, as long as you suction. Okay, does this make sense? So mm -hmm. if he's got copious amounts and log rolls on the side, let gravity be your friend. Again, you're still following the rules to suctioning. You're going to go in no more than 15 seconds come out and then oxygenation or free oxygenation prior to the next cycle of suctioning. Okay, it's important that we do that because of the dead space air. The secondary effect is that if we do a continuous suctioning amount more than 15 seconds because we're just trying to be aggressive to get it all out, then you are actually causing more damage because of hypoxia and it's because you are taking and pulling from the dead space air that needs to be there. Make sense? Yeah. So let's say they're, let's say they're just unconscious where, okay, well, let me just throw this, okay. So you have a drunk who's just got copious amounts of fluid, he's vomited a couple of times. You've got him on the side and he's got a lot of, could you not put a nasal cannula on him while you're suctioning for the 15 seconds, wait, and then add a non-rebreather on top for that couple of, couple of minutes that we want oxygenation, take that off and then resuction again. Mm -hmm. So again, think outside the box in a situation like that, you can do that. So just remember the rules to suctioning. Mm. Okay. Hard Any ones. questions? What? And let's say a patient has breathed in superheated air and they've got a lot of secretions coming out from either burns or anything like that. They are apneic. We have them on their side. They need PPV, but those secretions keep coming. Okay, so Where what takes precedence? Opening the airway. the airway. Yeah. Yeah, AP. If they're apneic, then that kind of changes things. That's what I mean. Where would we, I mean, it's... You gotta clear the airway in order to... We're also dealing with burns. Yeah, exactly. So with burns, it's gonna be a little bit different because we want some type of humidified oxygen. And so there's ways to rig uh, nebulized treatments and things like that to a BVM. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's kind so of that how big things go, but it's a good question, something to think yeah. about. Um, we don't do humidified. Uh, some ambulance services carry the actual bottle that goes on the Christmas tree before you actually put your oxygen to the, so it, once the oxygen comes through the bottle, it humidifies it before it goes out the tube. Yeah. That's one thing, a lot of services do not carry that. So yeah, you have to improvise. One of the improvisions that you can do is actually a nebulized treatment of just sterile water would be fine in order to kind of replenish some of the dryness that you're expecting in a burn patient with heated air. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Good question. You have to think outside the box. This, this is why you have to be quick on your feet. All right, Bradley, pick a next instructor. Joseph, great. He's going to go <laughs> to the board and he's going to explain to the class the different types of consents oh God. that you need to be aware of. <laughs> Not my strong suit. Okay. Class, today you're going to be helping me out. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to give you <laughs> a couple. Let's see. All right. Informed consent. If you're talking with a patient 
and you were discussing your procedure, what you were going to do before asking permission, informed consent. Okay? Pretty simple. consent. This is a situation where you have a patient who is unconscious or unable to make decisions for themselves. Um, people with uh, mental disorders and things like that nature would fall under implied consent. Is that a true statement? Not But definitely unconscious patients, patients who are um, well, prisoners. I think would be no, that's no, no, that's, 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 that's the same that's one. Consent. Okay, all right. This is why I need to kill someone. Okay, fine. Oh, fine. Help me out. Oh, you want what? Um, Can I, I got express. I know Go ahead. That. Yeah. Help him out. He's asking for your help. Class, work with me. I don't have my degree. I got here on a lot of hot air. Involuntary. <laughs> for the jail is involuntary. Involuntary, that's what I'm saying. Prisoners and people, I guess, with um, no rights. No rights. <laughs> well, that would be true. <laughs> Prisoner? Yeah. Who else are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> I'm just psychiatric <laughs> patients. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Psychiatric patients, prisoners. And what you said, I forgot that one. Wards of the state, Express basically, right? Oh, it says emotional rights. Yeah. yeah. That's what they would fall under. Like, Wards of the state. state. That's just where they're okay with it, yeah? Asking. Express consent? They basically That's tell like you both yeah, me. Head nodding, yeah. answering you, yes, yes. Yeah, giving you permission. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the different types of consent? Okay, pick somebody. <laughs> I keep forgetting you want to go. <laughs> you just want to get it out of the way. Out of here? No, no, no. no. I, I'm not in a rush or anything. Okay. Oh. Come on down here. Erase the board. You're going to talk about the respiratory system. You're going to start at the starting point and at the end of the point, and then you're going to actually talk about the process of inhalation. Honestly, I've got two of them, and I was just like sitting there wondering. Hmm. I almost said word of the state consent, but I was like, that's not right. Word of the state. Yeah. Okay. I got a brain fog in this one. Too. I know, she, she's got a lot going on, but that's okay. Go ahead. So we start just from the start. Start, start, start where, where you inhale and where it ends, and then talk about the mechanics behind inhalation and exhalation. Do I write down where it starts or do I just Oh, yeah, don't. Mm -hmm. You're going to draw it. I'm a visual oh. learner. Stick figure, whatever, whatever thing you do. <laughs> That is an acceptable Probably, that's probably a mouth and a chin. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it's better than the one I was making. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak up, ma'am? I'm a 31-year-old with a hearing aid. <laughs> Sucks, I know. Shut up. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Whichever one you want to do. Yep, yep. Fine, whichever one. So we're going to yep. focus on yeah. connecting. <laughs> Down there, expand that with the carbon dioxide from. 
the process of diffusion. Okay. What does diffusion stand for? Or what is the process? Diffusion means where something is abundant going to where it's not abundant. High concentration to a low concentration. Okay. Is that active or passive? Passive. passive. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. The perfusion is active. Perfusion was active. trying to get rid of anything? What? Are they trying to get rid of anything? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she said that already. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> hey, hearing aid. Bro. Hearing aid. Diffusion. <laughs> So what's the cutoff as far as the upper airway versus the lower airway? Larynx. Larynx, Larynx right? Okay, so you have to remember that. Okay, so the process, okay, inhalation you said is active. Well, what is involved with an active process in order to initiate breathing or inhalation at least? What happens? Diaphragm's contracting and the rib cage is moving out or up. You're creating a negative pressure. Okay, so negative. Okay, you have to understand the process. That's what happens is that the interthoracic pressure becomes more negative. That's how air is able to flow in. With the help of the diaphragm as it contracts, remember it's a dome shaped muscle, and as it contracts, it flattens out. Are there any accessory muscle uses in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay. And then what happens after it gets to a, a point where you can no longer do any more inhalation, then what happens to the interthoracic pressure for exhalation to occur? It relaxes. It's positive. Okay. It relaxes and becomes more positive, right? In order for air to rush out. Okay. Know the, the physiology behind ventilation. Okay. Yeah. Ventilation is air moving. Correct. Where is what? Is, where is respiration occur? Inside. No, I just thought we were talking about inhalation. in the cell, okay. right? Respiration happens at the cellular level, and there's internal and external respiration. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Oh. If not, it's okay. You did well. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. Let me point out. She did an awesome job. I hate you because you. Oh. I can't draw like you. Okay, so remember that you have the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, they come into the pharynx together. As it comes down, she knows, you know, like that upper lot of stuff there. That was an awesome class, okay? All right, so the larynx is the cutoff from the upper to the lower. Remember that as the trachea come down, you have the carina, which branches into a right main bronchus and a left main bronchus before it dizzies out to the bronchial to the alveoli. Tracking? Yep. Right. All right, pick somebody. Pick the teacher. Almost <laughs> 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 all that's left. Oh, Errol. Errol's last. Okay, 
okay, so Ramon's going to draw the heart, and he's actually going to trust the blood from and through the heart. I would have taken that over consent forms. <laughs> <laughs> I would have taken consent. Okay, you're going to have to give me a second to get the heart right. Sorry, so, uh, We're not going to judge. You're going to draw the heart? <laughs> like, don't oversell it yet. Yeah, where, what did you call yeah, that? It's a, it's a vein, bud. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. All right, so anyways, let's forget about what I said. <laughs> let's just focus on what I need to do. All right, so your blood enters in through here. Okay, you through what? Gonna, I'm going to draw the... Through what? Really bad. Okay, so uh, right atrium. Okay, yeah. so they come in to the, right. into the right atrium right. via what blood vessels? They like just told you. You know it. You know it. Vena cava, bud. Vena cava, yeah. Be specific. Okay. Uh, so it comes in and then it goes through your tricuspid okay. valve. And it goes from there, it goes to your right. You, you know this. Apparently not very well. Uh, <laughs> just breathe. You know this one. My mask is making it hard to do. Take the uh, mask off. Take it off. You're more than 10 feet away from everyone. Uh, <laughs> you're right, not atrium. Oh my god. Forgot everything. What's that above you? <laughs> A clock. On the ceiling. Next to the light. the brain good. and all of its functions. You don't want me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Errol's job's going to talk about the digestive system, where it starts, where it ends. He's going to talk about anything and oh. 
everything about the organ within the system. Oh God. So oh my know. God. I'm so I'm sorry, Errol. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we need to work on anatomy of this yeah. thing. Oh, don't worry. We're not, we're not halfway through anatomy yet. Uh, all right. There's still so much left. Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> Okay. Probably didn't There's want that as your one answer. <laughs> Wait, he only gets one? Oh, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Phone Probably would have been hard to see from there. Throat. Um. Well, I have a question. Now, when the blood comes out of the left ventricle, it goes to the aortic semilunar valve, the medial part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Um, okay, so we got we got the mouth. That's good. Okay, so food comes into the mouth, then it goes down what? What's the feeding tube called? Esophagus. Esophagus. Yeah. Esophagus. Okay, what prevents the food from going into the trachea? The glottis. The epiglottis. Okay. All right. Now where? Then it goes to the stomach. To the stomach. What does the stomach do? What's its primary job? Just break, break it down. Make it, down. Make it, break it down. Okay. Make it absorbable. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Destroy everything. everything. It doesn't matter. Just draw a circle. Stomach. Okay. There you go. Just draw a circle. It goes to the ankle. It ain't got to be that big. Yeah. Yeah. What are you eating? <laughs> He's having fish. stomach distension. Because yeah. he's eating stomach distension. Because he's eating stomach distension. What are you eating? He's having stomach distension because he's <laughs> over. <laughs> Gastric distension due to okay, over. Okay, so places. stomach comes next. All right. After it chimes the food. Comes out of the stomach and goes where? Uh, like, I know the sigmoid. Nope. Mm -mm. nope, nope You're thinking end of the line, bud. Uh, it's gonna go in the small intestine. Yeah, small. Okay. Small intestine. There's three parts to the small intestine. <laughs> Name them. The jillium? <laughs> yeah, jillium. Yeah, jillium. No, I don't know how to spell it. The jillium? Is it the three Ds? The jillium, jillium, and jillium. There's three seconds. Let's send them in order. Duodenum? Yeah. Okay. Duodenum. What's Ilium. the next one? Ilium. Jake Junum, and then? Ilium. Ilium. I thought alien was the second one. Same. Okay, yeah. then it goes into. But it went by the alphabet. Large, large, large intestine is all direction. Large, large intestine. Oh, yeah, because it go around like this. Mm -hmm. And okay. then it hits the thick one. Okay. Oh. The large intestine like cover the whole thing. No, it kind of makes its own little. of the large intestine. Okay, before we go there, what's the function of the small intestine? To absorb the nutrients. Yeah, absorb the nutrients, the nutrients and everything that the body needs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Large intestines does what? Absorbs the waste. Gets all the waste. Gets yeah. all the waste yeah. and? Turns it to the food. Water, yeah. if necessary, retains mm -hmm. water or pulls it out. Okay, go ahead, sorry. All right, directional terms of the large intestine. This way, man. Ascending. Ascending. What is this one? Trending. Transversal. Transverse. Transverse. Oh, oh transverse. Coming down is descending. descending into the colon. Sigmoid. Sigmoid, Sigmoid oh, into okay. the rectum. rectum and out the anus. anus. Okay. <laughs> Don't say that to the patient. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, it's been a while since we studied. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. All right, call a friend. Come on. Come on. Take bones over there. Bring them oh, over I here. Oh, I want to do bones. <laughs> Bring bones over here in the center of the room, and he's going to. I 
had to do consent, okay? <laughs> She's cold. Gotcha. Everyone's cheating. Team Mary, right? Team Mary, you don't worry. Oh, but I want to do a ball. Yeah, you can do a ball. Mine, man. Okay, let me go. Are you going to be busy later on this afternoon? I'll get you a drink if you actually know where the acromion is. Yeah, and you can't look. I already checked it. It's not listed on there. I know, no, I'm saying I need to look so I can think about it. The T. Maxima. 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 I thought you said maximum. I was like, It's the mask. Uh, 
11 and 12. Uh, because you have your ribs right there, you also have, under the same name, your thoracic vertebrae, which are basically right under C7 with T1 all the way down to T12. Then, so down here, with your uh, thickest one, what did you want? I got some questions about like shoulder plates and parts of the sternum. Can, can I finish this fine? No. Can I finish this fine? Sure. <laughs> All right. Because, you know, we already started at the top. Why am I going to stop the spine to go to the shoulder? You already. So you're part gonna of the sternum. You sassy. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now you got your lumbar. You got L1 through L5. That's where a lot of your lower back pain is going to be. That and your sacrum which is right here, which are all fused vertebrae. And then you have your uh, coccyx, which is your butt bone, basically, and it helps you control your ability to pivot. Break it, you can't poop it. You're, uh, you're incontinent. All right, now, let's go to the shoulders, because someone won't shut up about it. Well, you missed parts shut of the up. sternum, too, uh, but okay. <laughs> all right, so you got your shoulder blade, your scapula. Uh, it actually helps form your shoulder itself because your shoulder is actually just a joint, it's a ball and socket joint, very easy to uh, dislocate and it causes a lot of tension or a lot of problems if you do. Uh, this part right here, you have your process, ah, process, 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 process. Come on, I know this. The chromium process. Thank you. The chromium process, appreciate that. Uh, and that's right here, you got your uh, clavicle right here, mm -hmm. and that is your uh, collarbone. It's very easy to break if you're, you know, young and dumb. Uh, you got your humerus right here, very big bone in the arm. And then you have your, right here we go. You have your radial bone right here, and yeah. your ulna right radial here, or bone. radial right radial here. Bone. Okay, mm -hmm. ah, yes, radial. And then your ulna right here. Okay, uh, this is where your elbow is. It is a, not a ball and socket, it is a joint. I'm gonna get to it, hold on, give me a second. Okay, let's do the hands. All right, hands, you got your carpals, you got your uh, phalanges, your metaphor, uh, carpals to, carpals to phalanges to not phalanges to metacarpals, to uh, flanges. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Carpals. Carpals. Metacarpals. Flanges. Okay. All right, uh, continuing on, you have your hip bones, which is okay. your pelvic bones so right here. So the pause right there, break down the sternum. Sternum, the neck bone, or the <laughs> neck tie of the bone. Oh. You have your, uh, you, this whole thing is the sternum. Uh, you have the head, the body, and then you have your. Uh, Is that a specific name? I know. I know. I'm trying to think. <laughs> You're no help. I want you to know that. You can't tell me anything. Uh, not the xiphoid. Yeah. Uh, that is the xiphoid. The xiphoid process? What's the so then, portion? So this was the xiphoid. That's the zygomatic. Zygomatic exactly. arch. Uh, yeah, xiphoid process right here. If you break it while you're doing CPR, don't worry, that's gonna happen. Uh, it's also no, where you. Uh, I was gonna say that attaches the diaphragm. <laughs> no, so that it seems okay. Like it, if it cracks a little, you know. I mean, you're not uh, breaking it at all. Maybe ribs will, but I don't think it will. It all has to do with hand placement. If yeah. your hands like way low and you yeah. break that xiphoid, that's gonna cut through the diaphragm, diaphragm as well as puncture the the liver. The diaphragm is also attached to this right here. A good anchor point. So what's the top, what's the head part of the manubrium? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The manubrium. Yep, okay. My Work your way down. Body. That way process. All right. Now we already went to the lumbar. We're back at pelvis. That's the hip bone. Uh, you have your iliac arch. Crest. Crest. Like the toothpaste. Uh, then you have your, uh, there's actually a piece of cartilage right here that connects your two hip bones together. Which is called? Pelvic cartilage. <laughs> I don't know it though. Symphysis pubis? 
synthesis pubis. Yeah, I didn't have to remember that one. Uh, all right, so then we have a femur, one leg. Femur, right here, longest bone in the body, as well as also uh, where your femoral artery would be found. If you mess that up, well, you're, you're done. But uh, somehow, I'll figure it uh, now we got the last one. Oh, patella right here. Uh, yeah, patella is right here. Your kneecap. Uh, so some good knee. Then you have your. Let's show this up a little better. Uh, you have your tibia and your fibula. T tibia is the big one. Fibula is the small one. Sorry, should have said that. Uh, your Achilles tendon would be right here, tied into the back of your heel bone. Which is called? Your, I almost said patella, I don't know why. Uh, What's the heel bone called? That's the, uh, calcaneus. Calcaneus. You need to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, your popliteal would be back here. For, uh, that's how you find your pop, your the, for a pulse, FYI. Mm -hmm. You can also find a pulse on the top of the foot, right next to your tarsals, then your metatarsals, and your little phalanges for your feet. Say what that about one more time? The tarsals, yeah. Where do you find the pulse? On the top of the foot. What's it called? Which is called? Oh, I didn't say that. Uh, uh, well, it's definitely not your tarsals that you're feeling, it's the... Uh, your superior. I need you to learn sign language. I don't know. Okay, you're you're feeling the pulse. Oh, I was just scratching my mask. Dorsalis. You thought I was giving you. It is the dorsalis pedis. Yeah. Dorsalis pedis. Thank you. And then you got your. There's a pulse here that you can feel on the posterior of the ankle, next to the Achilles tendon, Which or near the Achilles. I'm just saying it. I, posterior tibialis. Posterior tibialis. Okay. Uh, What's the ankle bone? Phalanges, uh, metatarsals, tarsals, and the ankle bone is not a bone technically because you don't need to know that. That's just a, just a curiosity. What's the heel bone again? Say it again. What's the heel Calcaneus. 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 Do you need to know that? If you had an E in your It's good for you to know. It's good for you to know. Yes, you have two. Right here. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so we're studying a lot this weekend, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, phone yeah. a friend. Okay, well, I'm sorry, before we continue, what's the purpose and what's the function of the musculoskeletal system? Musculoskeletal system, the skeletal system. Uh, and the musculoskeletal system, uh, the muscle part of it, obviously, is to help you move. Not only help you move, but also, uh, you know, like help move the actual, like, help you move fluid, things like that, like the muscles to help you, like, push stuff around. Uh, then you got the skeletal system, which gives you, you know, your form so your muscles can provide function and, and also protection. Yep. Any other questions? What's the difference between ligaments? Ooh, ligaments nice. are bone oh, to yeah. muscle, while tendons are. No, yes. No. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> you guess it yourself. <laughs> I, that's a, I hate you. Uh, <laughs> ligament is. Ligament, bone to bone. Tendon, bone to muscle. Final answer. Did you agree? Did you all agree? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Ligament is bone to muscle, and then the other one. Is bone. All right. Thank you. Put him back. Call a friend. Oh, uh, go ahead, Shelly. Shelly, you know. 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 Shelly, I would have been fine with that. I would have been fine with well. what Joseph had. So, <laughs> no, I would have been used to the war consent. No, that's one of the things. 
I had two of them getting out of it. <laughs> I know, man, but okay. I couldn't catch it. <laughs> okay, so chili sauce? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought she was about to leave. I was I like, know, I don't know that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you was just one and done. All right, cool. All right, chili. The integumentary system. I don't know nothing about that. You need to draw all skin? three layers. Yeah. You need to oh, tell us the skin? function, yeah. the purpose. Your oh, epidermis, your dermis, and your other Any layers. fun facts you want to list there? Okay. Okay, inventory system is the skin. There are three layers. And this is this layer is the outer layer. And this, this is where your nerves are. What's that top layer called? Epidermis. Okay, what's the next layer? The dermis. And then the sub. You got this. Subcutaneous. Sublingual. No. Subcutaneous. Okay. Subcutaneous. Okay. And my accent came out. Okay. Q. I don't know how to say it. Okay. Sensory. Yeah, sure. Allowing you to actually. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what else? Why, why do we care about the skin, and especially if it's um, been compromised? Because if you, let's say, if you were to get burned, and you were to have a first or a second degree burn, it could interfere with um, your. Permeability, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, well, all your insides, well, not all your insides, but you'll be exposed. Um, Why? Infection. infection. Yeah. If you were to get burned, um, a lot of bad stuff can hurt happen if your skin was to break open, like if you're more prone to infection. Okay. So, how does your body, how does your skin help cool your body? Sweat um, gland. Sweating. Okay. It allows you to sweat. And? And, um, heat retention. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm saying radiation. I'm, I'm saying, how does your body cool, how does your skin help your body cool? Not retain. 
came here, how does it cool the body? It opens up your pores and causes you to sweat by releasing salt. And water. Okay, and what water else? Salt. What else happens when you sweat? Yeah, the evaporating yeah, sweat. What else? Yeah. How else does the skin help your body cool off? I don't know. Rosa, you I know it's um, simple, too. Just say it. About Call a friend. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's pointing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Bradley. I bet Bradley knows. <laughs> Bradley's like, Bradley 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 Bradley. Bradley. Hey, well. How else does your body cool off? We got to think about it. No, we thank you. We, we thank you. How the body cools up? Well, I take a shower, but that's my body. Nope. <laughs> it built regular. Nope. Thank you, brother. I mean, your hair, what do you call it? The I hair mean, can catch the wind and it helps you cool down, but it also does that to warm up, though, so I don't yeah. want to say that. Yeah. Like down feathers, I mean, so I don't want to say that one. It sticks up when it knows you're cold. Yeah, so it can catch air and then warm it up against your body, but that no, one's warm. No. Something like that. <laughs> no? That's not goosebumps? You're not a doctor. I know I'm not. You're I'm not here, ain't I? You're not understanding what the process is and what the purpose of the hair standing up. The, it takes energy mm -hmm. to cause that, to, and it's producing heat mm -hmm. with the papillary reflex of the hair standing up. Mm -hmm. So how else does the skin help the body cool off other than sweating? Because we already know once you start sweating, then you're, you know the wind hitting, you're going to evaporate, and that's how you're going to cool off. What else? Think about what's found in the different layers and how the skin helps to cool the body off. I don't want to say blood the rises. Veins, they dilate? Okay, and then they do what? You're on the right track, Chili. They slow down. No. Right. Um, I mean, they just push more blood through. Mm, it's like around it, a shrub. it brings the blood vessels to the top to of the, the skin. Surface. Oh, okay, right. good. I didn't want to say that because I thought that was warming it up. But now that I know, it up, I'm gonna it say goes in the opposite direction. Yeah, that's what right. I, so. I want to go ahead and say that with confidence. Yeah. Okay. So let's see what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then blood vessels dilate. Remember, the vessels are found in the subcutaneous, and if you begin to get so hot, what happens? Your your veins start coming to the surface oh, and rises yeah. to the surface, so right, that if there's any mm -hmm. type of air coming across. It'll help when you work cool out. off. That's how when a person dies, their veins start to go to the surface too. So, and they get cold. I thought that. I thought that's. Okay, I thought that. okay, so in order to help retain heat, they pushes it further down into the subcutaneous, and then that's when the pap when the hairs begin to start shifting upward and cause goosebumps because when they begin to maneuver and they shift upward and stand straight up and you get the goosebumps, it's actually producing heat in order to help warm your body. Uh, so that's why, that's like why. So it's jumping you're jacks for your hair. Stuff, that's why your veins pop out. out. Yeah. They're hot. You're making them hot. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now I know. Now my face is Okay. So that's how <laughs> come, obviously, out. when yeah. you're working out and doing stuff, you got to replenish the water that you're yeah. releasing with yeah. sweat yeah. and yeah. the salt this can take as well. Hi, bro. Call Arrow. I gotta go. <laughs> Do you leave him for the day? Yeah. He's got a doctor's appointment. Well, okay. All the good stuff I'm good at is already done. <laughs> Urinary system. Okay. <laughs> Kidneys, yeah, got you. <laughs> you want to help draw oh, it? Because that's the one thing I'm actually good at drawing. Throw this away. <laughs> you want me to draw those kidneys for you? I think you could. <laughs> I believe in you. I'm okay. <laughs> you just really want it. That's fine. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, 
Okay, so we have the kidney processing and filtering waste from the body, uh, bringing that down through ureters to the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder stores the urine, which then passes through the urethra up top. Um, I'm forgetting something else in here. Nephron. Mm -hmm. What's the functional unit of a kidney? That cell? Functional unit? Mm -hmm. What's the functional unit of a kidney? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, Come on, tell him. Uh, the nephron? The yeah. nephron. Nephron, okay. All right, and what's that big old thing on top of the kidney? And what's it for? He just included that. That's just a bonus that you're having to answer. I'm not so sorry. Sure. If I, I run fast that enough, it could go adrenaline away. Adrenaline and things like that can be released. Your adrenal glands. So I'm not sure if that's. Adrenal glands. Then, yeah, okay. Okay, so adrenal glands, glands, it releases. Epinephrine. And? Norepinephrine. And? You said it already. Damn, I know the one. We were just talking about it. Um, it shares the same name. We just said no, epinephrine, nor epinephrine. Oh, not, it's not adrenaline? You call it A. It's not adrenaline? You're adrenaline an is epinephrine. Okay. Um, it's the other one, and it doesn't, it's not vasopressin. It's uh, acetylcholine. 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 Okay. So that, urea, urinary bladder. Body getting rid of waste, filtering it, releasing hormones back into the system. Stores sodium as well. Mm. It regulates blood pressure through either retaining sodium retaining or sodium. Uh, releasing yeah. sodium. Put okay. the water in or. Mm -hmm. So what happens when the kidney fails? What is kidney, kidney failure? Fails, um, what is kidney? Okay, so define John kidney failure. failure. It would definitely be a sign. Um, what? No. Jaundice isn't a sign of kidney failure? Huh. Well, a sign of, like, if their urine is pretty much brown, that would be a sign. That's not kidney failure. I thought that was kidney failure. Yeah. That could be a bad kidney infection, but that's not kidney failure. Huh. Kidney stone. Okay, what are kidney stones called? Uh, and we just had this earlier, too. Uh, calcit. Yep. Calcium Same. something. What does kidney failure look like? What's the definition of kidney failure? I mean, it's your body's filter system. It's one part of it. Um, not being able to get rid of waste. Um, Decreased urinary output. Okay, because of why? Because your body's failing to actually, like, put it together. Produce you urine. Yeah. Are you looking it up? Yeah. Of course he is. Okay, so Look, man, it's failure, here for you. Okay, so with renal failure, what's the big deal? So I can't produce pee. What's the big deal? Can't get that waste out. Well, we're not actually putting, yeah, we're not releasing waste that the body's trying to filter out. Okay, so or, what's the treatment? Um, a machine, dude. Dialysis. Okay, name the two different types of dialysis. Killing me today. I know. <laughs> Blood and peritoneal. So hemodialysis and peritoneal. Dialysis. You said hemo? Yes, hemo dialysis. Yes. Hemodialysis. So blood, That's the blood. machine. Yeah. And then the other one is peritoneal. Mm -hmm. Can we get an explanation on that one from 
Are there still in class? <laughs> Okay, so hemodialysis is when they are, you're connected to the machine yeah. and the machine does the filtering of the blood as it's entering and then coming back in. It yeah. passes through all the machine work and all the different types of chemicals and filters in order to replenish and clean the blood and it's restored back to your system. It's through a fistula or a port. Remember that the fistula is in the arm and it connects an artery directly to a vein and then there's a port that you have to access. <coughs> Do you remember this from renal emergencies? Mm -hmm. They also had something similar we talked about with diabetes. Okay. I remember, right, with the port having to move around the abdomen. That has nothing to do with dialysis. Oh. Dialysis is a set port. Oh, okay, yeah. never mind, okay. my bad. All right. Got my Thing. What was peritoneal? Peritoneal is when they actually have bags of solution yes, that right. is that is inputted into the abdominal cavity and it sits there for four to six hour, hours and then it's drained out the other side. Which absorbs it. Is that what that said? Oh, interesting. Yep. So okay. because the peritoneal and the peritoneum is so vascular, once the fluid goes in there, it kind of pulls out the waste products into the solution and then it is flushed out the system. Know the two types of dialysis. Oh, okay. What you doing? I mean, you've been hitting me on a good one. I know. Yeah, okay, so but what, what's one of the major differences between the urinary system in a male versus a female? Uh, what we're filtering out. I mean, for the male, I mean. Don't think, don't. Don't think too much into it. It's very simple. What's the difference between the urinary system of a male versus a female? Uh, Sharon, help him out. <laughs> I know you want to say it. You're like, <laughs> yeah, go for it. I mean, the just. The is longer in males. Yeah. Okay, that was simple. That was super simple. simple. That's yeah, I was simple. like, okay, mm -hmm. don't overthink it, because again, <laughs> as far as the function of the urinary system is no different. It's just the structural difference. Yeah. Okay, which makes female more prone to UTIs. UTIs. Okay, males is a different story unless they have like an in. in it's not an implanted catheter. I'm sorry, an implanted catheter, or if they have a super a supra pubic catheter, that's the only way that they normally get UTIs. Okay. Okay, unless they're like. Anyway, all right. Call uh -huh. somebody else. I know you have been playing with my whole life. <laughs> okay. Sharon, come on down. I kind of wish I had brought my thing because I don't remember it. Okay, so I want you to list for me on the board signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. Damn it. Sorry. I would have taken that one. <laughs> It's like she can see through us what our weakness is. <laughs> the number one that most people do is all over the place. <laughs> I was trying to talk about the skin, yeah. but I didn't know how to Remember sign. Skin. Alright, she got it. Just gonna be dark right?
kind of temperature might you be seeing? Cool. Yeah. It's not the same thing as diaphoretic. Yeah. What else? Some few sweating. What are some of the What are some of the early signs of hypoxia? Anxiety. Uh, restlessness. Mm -hmm. Restlessness, anxiety. Okay. As it progresses, definitely more altered mental status. What else? Tachypnea, tachycardia. Mm -hmm. What about your vitals? Tachycardic. Cyanosis in there, I think. Yeah. The same yeah. state. It can be as it progresses. So yeah, like, so, like around the mouth, but sign. not the same. Cyanosis not would be one as it progresses to get worse. Well, the bradycardia was falling there too, isn't it? Late stage. Late stage, yep. Lost that nasal flare in your kids. Mm -hmm. Head bobbing too. Keep writing. Head bobbing, seesawing, and nasal flaring for children. They're going to be diaphoretic and. What's your treatment? Oxygen. <laughs> oxygen. <Okay. laughs> okay. So oxygen. You have so many delivery devices. So list all the delivery devices with their percentages and liters per minute. How much O2 is on room air? It's just above what? Not 10, it's 21%, right? So that's already out in the O2. That's there. So that's your minimum. That's your bottom bar. Nothing's going below that. Unless you got them in some kind of chamber without O2. 24 to 44%. You need to know it. Middle ground. I think it's just as a 15. Mm -hmm. No, it's simple. Eight. It's above a nasal cannula but below a partial. Mm -hmm. 8%? 6 to 6. Into wheel wool, it will be straight up 15. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And then the Venturi mass? That's the precise, whatever you said it to. Yep. Percentage precise, thank you. So if you remember in your book, whenever you're dealing with a non-rebreather, you do not want that reservoir bag to decrease every time heat increases by two-thirds. So on smaller people who take smaller volume, it may not be that you have to maintain it at 15. It could be 12, could be 13, 14. So that's something there's a range there. But if you're doing a total non-rebreather, it needs to be straight up 15. Okay. Yeah, they they gonna need you know they gonna need all. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. At least two both have a reservoir, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So go home and find that in your book and know the percentages. Okay, because a uh, total monitoring breather is almost not, uh, almost 100 percent. They say more from 95 to 100 percent. Um, partial monitoring breathers can be more 90 to 95 because of the fact that they are inspiring um, in the air. ambient air. Yeah. And then the uh, simple face max I think is something like 60 percent, 40 to 60 percent. Simple face is up to 60. Partial non is 35 to 65. Total is 98 to 100, and then the Venturi is uh, and that's book knowledge. All right, so simple face mask up to 60 percent. Perfect. It will be more than 44 percent to up to 60, because again, you're stepping up from a nasal cannula. It's 45. All right, partial non. 35 to 65. Yeah, that's what you told us. Book knowledge. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, total is 98 to 100. Yeah, some partial so, breathers, they, they have both of them open, yeah. and then a total is And then closed. Venturi yeah. is so just, yeah, precise the, concentration specified to the far. medicine. Oh, it's on the it's on the video, so like, I already zoomed in. It's all there. Yeah, I don't know. As long as I didn't knock it over. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, because I mean, you're with two holes, you're inspiring more ambient air, whereas with one, it's half of what you're breathing in, and then again, the total is when both of them are closed. That way, the inhalation is coming straight from the reservoir bag. You basically mm. partial at 10 or 12 with both valves opening it. I still think it would be above 40 percent. Mm. But yeah, but book knowledge. Yeah. Again. All right. Any questions on this? Great. Call your next person. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish we'd switch. Bradley, come on down. Bradley, go on down. Erase all the stuff. Ready, Bradley? No. <laughs> <laughs> he's, very, he's very afraid. He already knew the right answer. <laughs> All right, Bradley. Nitro. I want to know everything about it. Indications, contraindications, side effects, dosage, precautions. I want to know everything about nitro and why you give it. Because we've been having this discussion for a while, and I just went ahead and got a box of Cortex. 
I'm bring what? In, I'm gonna bring in at the end of the when we're about to go on break, but everyone's like, I'm gonna bring in some market like no, like literally. I'll bring them in. Some, we're gonna see if you bring the looks for a break. Yeah. Go ahead, Why are you fighting with me? <laughs> Marker. Help the class. Do you want me to I don't care, it doesn't have to be in order. I just what wanna know perfect. everything there is to know about nitro. Of course has to keep it like uh, you know how ballpoint pens have those little chambers? Mm -hmm. It keeps the ink forward so if you angle it up and right on the board. Mm. It doesn't do this. Okay. Use a different marker. I can't see that one. That does sound real like me left handed. A little late to the party there, bud. Joseph in the head, what would that be? Oh yeah, the head and battery. <laughs> you shouldn't give someone with head injuries due to mm -hmm. the increased flow to the, to the blood pressure. Um, Is that what you actually wrote down on your drug card? No. I didn't think so. I, so what's another contraindication of nitro? Um, would you stop rooting him on? <laughs> he can call a friend. Okay, he can yeah. phone a friend. Um, lifeline. <laughs> lifeline. There we go. Hemorrhage. Okay, let me see if I can help you out with that one. What's the side effect of nitro? You weren't supposed to bring any of that with you. Well, I needed... Or am I supposed to bring a lot? Okay, Blood pressure. Hypotension. So what's a contraindication in nitro? Someone who's 
got uh, the below uh, 90 for the systolic. Systolic. Okay. All right. So we got the indications, the contraindications, part of the side effects. What's the dose? The dose would be. to that rule based on the, the blood pressure the stop drug pressure the fluid pressure based on whatever number is at after five minutes mm -hmm. you would check and then determine whether it could be used again or not based on that because if it's below 90 it can be used due to a possibility of it dropping the blood pressure even more which could cause severe issues perfect going over precautions like you could do it, oh. but you should take caution. Yeah. For oh. what reasons? I already gave you two. Right. <laughs> what are some of the other side effects we should be aware of? Okay, stinging epidermal headache. Okay, stinging epidermal headache, hypotension. What are some of the other side effects of nitro? blood pressure so you're watching for AMS. Yeah. Okay, so what you say heart rate when they get a nitro? Decrease heart rate, did you say? No, because you're dilating, so the heart's working more. So you're looking for an increased heart rate. So, so that's you what you're expecting, right? Yeah. Just a little bit of tip you know, with nitro. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of okay. All right, pick a person.
kid, I went to the, you know, the mental education, right. put them, and then they told me, you know, set up an account, whatever, and I did that. And then I clicked on for the registration of the class, and then I clicked launch, and it just sent me to Adobe Premiere, and then it just told me, ooh, you can't get in. Are you using Google Chrome or Foxfire? Uh, no, I'm using Safari. I got to the, the demo one, they told me. Okay, they told, your, the yeah, they told me they weren't going to send it to me until like two days after, so okay. it should be here like tomorrow. Doing great. <laughs> give me a check. Check. Give me a. Oh. Oh. Give me a check. Check. Now I'm actually really important. Mm. Alright, well, tell us what you got so far. Alright, so FE 101000. Um, I've got the classes of Compatible Mimetic. Okay, so can you turn and talk this way? <laughs> there you go. Look um, at the mustache. Wow, class is sympathomimetic. Action is a basic constrictor on bronchodilator. Indication is for anaphylaxis. Um, at least to our degree, I know it can be used higher tiers of other things. Um, contraindications, precautions. Okay, so stop right there. So as far as higher indications, that's the wrong concentration for us. There are several different concentrations, so just Are be we aware. more than 10? No, we're not one. I thought it was one of one thousand for us. For y'all, yeah. But oh, okay, yeah. Us, that's you're okay. I was about to say. It's a different kind yeah, of Yeah, one in ten thousand. Mm -hmm. You guys are using that for all kinds of fun things. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, contraindications. I've got a basal constrictor and bronchodilator. Why would I not want to get that? Um, they're not suffering anaphylaxis. Um, Allergy would be high heart rate. Right? Yeah. Right. Increased heart rate and increased. Uh, is that a contraindication or is that a precaution? Oh, uh, there's a precaution. Mm -hmm. There's a precaution. Decreased. Uh, if they have, I imagine, high blood pressure as well. Precaution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, when you're talking about anaphylaxis, you're going to have to ensure that HTN, oh. honey, HTN. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, you're going to have to look at it in the fact that the benefits is going to outweigh the risks at that point. Especially, Especially if, if it's true anaphylaxis. anaphylaxis. Yeah, of course pregnancy is a precaution. Well, I think that would be contraindication. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't give FE. To a pregnant patient who's an anaphylaxis, absolutely we would. Absolutely. It's a precaution. <laughs> it's a precaution. Do we necessarily okay. want to give it to them? We but want to give no, it to but if somebody who's not prescribed it. Mm -hmm. You gotta be dangerous. Or a high sensitivity. Yeah. Allergy. Allergy, right? They're not necessarily gonna have an allergy to okay. epi considering that your body makes right. it naturally. Don't even write that, honey. Okay. That's not a contraindication. Hypersensitivity to epinephrine is not a contraindication. Your body makes epi, so how would that be a contraindication? It could be a rare disease yeah, out there no, where no. there's studies and doctors who are looking this over, and it's very dangerous in so, high quantities. So when <laughs> Let me zoom in on your face as you know, say this right? little one. <laughs> so in true Look like Satan's little brother. is there really any contraindication? No, I don't think no, not no, really. Just precautions? Because they are not, have not necessarily yeah, in... Precautions in the emergency that you're treating it for. Gotta be safe, but um, like you said, it rate. won't be strict to pain. High blood pressure. Right. Um. Well, we have some increased blood rate, increased blood pressure. Oh yeah, because basal um. constrictors, that's blood rate, and that's um, blood pressure. 
Soon follow. Yeah. All right. So what's the dosage? Um, it's going to be 0.3. Three what? Uh, milligrams. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we have a lot of different weights out there. Okay. Yeah. So for pediatric, um, I believe it's 0.1, 1, 0.15. For pediatric? I thought it was. Oh, for. I don't think we can. Oh, wow. Phone a friend. Lifeline? Lifelines? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? You give me the look. <laughs> I'm getting the look like I don't know why you calling on me. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is a point one five. if I... So I was right. Okay. .15? That's what I remember. Pediatric? Okay. Or pediatric? Oh, point .1? <laughs> <laughs> .05? <laughs> Point zero one five. I'm about to get this. <laughs> we'll wait until my uh, turn. Adult and pediatric is the same. The infant dose is going to be different. That's the one zero point one five. Yeah. Okay. So then they get the same. Wait. Okay. Well, I mean, think about. I got a, less than sixty five pounds. Ten year old. Think about a seven year old. They can be pretty chunky and meaty. Oh. Sorry, I'm just saying it. Just saying it. It's but man, it's a hard time for me, okay? <laughs> okay, so, okay, so pay attention to your dosage. Thing. Yeah, I got oh, up to weight by six, <laughs> once it hits 65, or less than 65, it's 0.15. Yeah, I'm okay. 0.15 okay. for infants. Okay. For the toddler, maybe it's 40. Okay. Honestly, I don't think I have that written down right on my card. I yeah, I want to correct child. mine now. Yeah. There, not Child is 0 0.3, and then infants yeah. would be different. He's got them actually broken down by weight. Oh, so mine's cool by weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but definitely the infant dose will be significantly different. Significantly different. You have to put milligrams. That is going to be incorrect if you leave it blank on Fair. your test. Fair. Because there's milligrams, micrograms, milliliters, liters. I mean, we can go on and on as far as that is concerned. I think I lost your cap. All right. I used to have a high school teacher right. back when I took <laughs> chemistry. And uh, if you forgot to say the units when he asked you a question, We're gonna he would be like, mm -hmm, video mm -hmm, and you never know. You, you never know when he's going to say it, but he'll come up behind you and say you forgot the units, but he'd yell it right in your ear, and it would startle you every time. You don't know where he is in the classroom. And then terrible, he'd terrible man. on the lateral side of the thigh, and I would hold it there until it slowly injects for 10 seconds, and then remove it. And the patient is, yeah, okay. can you massage it? <laughs> you can. Yeah. My patient's, you know, kind of falling out of uh, consciousness, maybe just Wrap their hand around. <laughs> okay, yeah. You're wearing gloves. There's what no fingerprints. It doesn't matter. Stays in the so I'm just saying sometimes they'll Take be to the, the point. And, Take what off the video. Just, just be mindful that it's probably going to take more than one dose. Yeah. Right. Depending on weight. So if you're having to give them the first one and they don't have a second dose, you better be in route to the hospital or you should have an ALS unit that's going to intercept because they're going to need more than one dose. Honestly, after our ABCs, we should already call that. So if it's true it. anaphylaxis, and again, it doesn't take a long period of time for full anaphylaxis to take place. You're talking a couple of minutes mm -hmm. from the exposure. So if they don't have epi, by the time you get there, you're probably going to be doing CPR on somebody. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, considering the 
during that time frame, in most cases, we're probably coming up to a confiscation. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, because again, true anaphylaxis.